Welcome to Time Saving Tips. I'm Nancy Zeman and thank you for joining me. This is a special half hour video produced exclusively for Oxmoor House, the publisher of my new book, 10, 20, 30 Minutes to Sew. In this video, I'm going to share with you some of the ideas that are in the book that you've ordered, so feel free to follow along as I'm showing you these notions and techniques. Primarily, I'm going to be working with notions. I've singled out half a dozen or so of notions, showing you the basic techniques of working with them, but then also showing you some other ways of making the most use of your time by using them, making your garment look very professional, and then again, saving some time. My whole idea behind 10, 20, 30 minutes to sew is that for you to set aside 10, 20, or 30 minutes of time each day for sewing. You do not have to finish a whole garment in that time, but a portion of a project. You'll be amazed how these minutes of time accumulate so that you'll have a finished garment. I'd like to get set up at my table to start showing you these ideas. The first notion that I'd like to show you that saves time is a pocket curve template. This notion has two different parts. Obviously a template part with different corner shapes at each edge and then a clip section. The clip section helps hold the fabric around the template. As the name implies, it uh, is obviously used to shape a pocket, and I'd like to show you how to work with that on a rounded cornered patch pocket. Let's take a close look at the pocket first of all. I have interfacing fused to the wrong side of the pocket, minus the seam allowances, and minus the hem allowance. I like to have the pocket shaped to its finished size, we'll, keep it, we'll allow it to have body on the right side. When working with your template, find which shape of the corner best suits your corner of the pocket. And generally I find this wider corner is what I like to use. Simply put the template following the interfacing, in other words at its finished size, and then put the clip section on the right side of the fabric and clip it around the edge. You may want to double check to make certain everything's even. This is a metal notion. It transfers a lot of heat and this t clip section really helps because you do not have to hold on to the edges of the fabric and kind of get hot fingers doing this. You can simply use the tip of your iron to press. I'd like to give you, show you how I usually press this. Now I'm working with a little bulkier fabric than a real sharp crisp fabric. So I'm not going to give a super sharp edge, but I'm just going to get the shaping that I'd like. And working from the tip, simply press this forward, and a lot of steam will be very helpful at this, with this fabric. You can see what a nice shape this gives. Then after it has dried a while, maybe I'd let this dry a few more seconds if I would be sewing this at home, move the template around to the other corner. This is where the beauty of this comes. Generally, you can get one corner of the pocket looking just the way you'd like, but the, the difficult thing is to get the other corner identically matched. Now use the template clip, place it around the corner of the pocket, double check your seam allowances, and repeat. And for my fabric, again, I need lots of steam. And let this dry. And when I pull this off, I'll find from the right side that my corners are identical. Nice symmetry. The next step is to do the sewing of putting the pocket into place. And in chapter two, Fast Fashion Elements, you'll find ideas or techniques of putting the pocket to your garment. So you can read through those. But let me give you some hints about working with corners of the patch pocket. Sometimes I've seen for directions to clip the corners, and I rarely like to do this. I feel it weakens the seam. I would rather recommend that you trim this area, trimming off a fourth of an inch, maybe up to three-eighths, but no more than that amount. This will eliminate some of the bulk from the rounded corner, and you'd repeat on the other side, and then it's ready to place onto your jacket or to your top. On this sample, I'm ready to position it onto the jacket. I have it going to pin it into place. And now you can either top stitch it, hand stitch it if you'd really like, or what I'm going to recommend is to use a blind hem stitch. In our chapter six on needle know-how and feet smarts, I'll show you how to use this technique of the blind hem stitch. I have the stitch stitched on a piece of paper to show you that it's a straight stitch followed by a zig, three stitches straight, and a zig. 
The straight stitches are stitched along the well of the pocket, along the edge, and the zigzag stitch goes up into the pocket to hold it into place. On a nubby fabric such as this, to keep those stitches really concealed and hidden, I added another time-saving idea, and that is to use clear monofilament thread. Many people think of it as fishing line because it looks and feels that way. It's either available in the smoke colors you see here, or there is a clear version as well. This is almost invisible when you're working with it, and when you're stitching it onto your garment, you can s hardly see the stitching, making it look like a hand-stitched pocket. And, and I think it's really great on textured fabrics such as this. So those are some hints of working with pockets and the pocket curve template. But there's more to the template than just working with pockets. Here's a collar. Peter Pan collar is on this little girl's dress, has sharp little curves in the collar area. Sometimes to press these, it becomes difficult. We're going to use the template for pressing, but I have an idea that will save you time when sh shaping this collar. I have some contrasting fabric pieces. My guide to you is to trim the under collar smaller by an eighth of an inch all the way around the seam area. Then meet the edges together as if they were the same length and stitch the seam line around the edge. I'm using, again, contrasting interfacing for you to see. This is the upper collar, and it looks bigger, because it is, than the under collar section or area. When you do the trimming, turn it right side out, the collar is nicely shaped. That seam is on the underside. After turning this right side out, then I use the template not the clip section, just the square section, placing different, the different shape of the template to meet the curve of the collar and do the final pressing. This template also prevents the seam allowances from leaving a ridge on the right side because I put the template between the fabric and the seam allowances, and it's really a great pressing tool. Another pressing idea is kind of on the same order that we just worked with, this time on collar bands that tiny little piece that's between the garment and a tailored collar, this small little strip of fabric. The difficult section is this corner right in this area. Think of it as a mini Peter Pan collar, and on this sample, I simply had, would put the template in this section to do the pressing. So with the pocket curve template, there are many ways that it can help you save time. For the next time-saving technique, I'd like to show you how to use a Simflex gauge, an expandable gauge to mark buttons and buttonholes. When I first saw this notion, I thought of it as a gadget, that something that I really wouldn't use. But really, I've changed this term to a notion. Notion is something that you use when I found out how to properly use this. The Simflex gauge, obviously, is an expandable gauge. But when I first used it, I thought, oh, it isn't even between the different spokes. I'd like to show you how to properly use it, and that is to expand it to its fullest potential. If you're working with a new gauge, you might find it slightly stiff. So I would suggest at this point, after it's expanded, to find your sewing machine oil and put a drop of oil at each joint or at each intersection. You're going to have to then wipe this off with a rag so as to remove all of the excess oil, but then it will move very easily. Now, in marking spacing for button and buttonholes, again, expand it all the way to its fullest potential and then retract it. When it's retracting, then the gauge points are equidistant. And you can be assured that they will work about fine for spacing your button and buttonholes. Sometimes I mark every spoke. Sometimes I go with every other one. It depends how wide or how far between I'd like the mark button and buttonholes. I'm going to start with the right side first, placing the spokes so that I can see the black intersection fully, so that it's not flipped, so that it's hidden by the spokes, but so that the black section is visible and align the end of the spoke with the finished edge of the placket. And we'll straighten this a little bit. You will find that at the end of each spoke, there's a window. And each window is gridded into a fourth, a 
half, three-fourths in one inch. If I've determined that I'd like to have my buttonhole start a half inch from the fold, I'll simply go through the window, oop, excuse me, and at the half of an inch and make a dot. And you'd mark the entire length of your blouse front in this manner. Again, you may want to skip every other spoke if you found that the spacing was too close together. Then after you've marked this area, I would measure the distance from the top to the bottom, or the top of the blouse to the first spoke, and then flip the spokes around so that I had the same distance on the left side from the top to the first spoke. Do a little measuring. Align the spokes again. And find the half inch mark. Now I have both the button and buttonholes marked and I can do this at the very end of my sewing and I can be assured that everything will be straight. Fusible thread is our next time-saving notion. It's a two-ply thread, one ply of polyester, the other ply of melt adhesive nylon that makes surging and sewing a breeze. It has many uses and I'd like to show you a couple of them now. When working at my sewing machine, I like to use the fusible thread or the brand name of thread fuse in the bobbin. Wind a couple of bobbins with the thread fuse. You'll find it coming on a cone of thread and you can see I have some little initials put in my bobbin because many times I find that if I do not mark my bobbin, I may mistake it later for just plain white thread. It's heavier, but still in a quick hurry, you may find that you're putting the wrong one into your bobbin case. The first area I'm going to show you to work with it is as hemming, let's say decorating ideas, curtains, or tablecloths. And I'm going to zigzag from the right side of the fabric so that the thread fuse is on the bob wrong side or the bobbin case is stitching the thread fuse. Set your machine for a relatively wide zigzag stitch. You're going to be clean finishing the edges as well as applying the hemming agent to the wrong side. You simply stitch all the way around your hemline. If you're working with a serger, you'd use the same concept, placing the thread fuse in the lower looper. Here's a close-up of a four-thread serger where the lower looper thread is not the gray as in the other threads, but it is the thread fuse. It is put through the guide of the tension for the lower looper. Here's a sample of what it looks like on the wrong side for both methods. On the zigzag, stitch, you'll see a heavier line, that's the thread fuse on the wrong side. For the surged area, it's gray on the right side, and on the wrong side, you can see that fusible thread in place. Make certain that the thread does not, the fusible thread does not come up to the right side because that would get on your iron. You want it tucked away underneath. At the ironing board is where you get the next step. You're going to be fusing this into place. Let me just show you about the thread fuse and what happens at your ironing board. It's activated by heat and moisture, or a little of both. You can see how this shrinks, and that's it bonds to the fabric, just like fusible interfacing. On my sample, either on the surged or the sewn section, you'd simply use a press cloth and press the top layers. and it bonds to the area and it's automatically hemmed. Another area where I like to use this is to place a surged edge along a zipper and then baste the zipper into position in the seam allowance and this will hold it in place long enough for me to top stitch it. It's a great time saving idea. A collar point and tube turner is the perfect notion to use to accurately turn corners on collars, lapels, and cuffs. It also has a great use for spaghetti straps. I'd like to show you a close-up look at this unique notion that kind of looks like an ice tong. It's not going to separate very far, about an inch to an inch and a fourth through the center, and it has two points, one rounded end and one sharper point. Generally, we're going to put the fabric on the rounded end first, then the sharper point will bring out the corner of the collar or cuff. When working with spaghetti straps, again, we're going to put it on the rounded end first. But first, let's do corners. I'm going to show you how to use this notion, plus how to make a wrapped corner. 
in the chapter three on surging the ultimate time saver in the book 10, 20, 30 minutes to sew, you'll get the details of working with wrap corners. This is the only way that you can turn corners with using a serger. It's a great way for construction. Also going to combine thread fuse when working with this. Rather than sewing the collar by sewing the center edge and the outer edge and the other center edge, we're going to just sew the outer edge first of all, the long outer edge. On the lower looper, I had the fusible thread as my thread. This is facing the under collar section. The reason I'm using this is that this acts as an understitching. I'll show you how. When pressing, I'm going to press the seam allowance covering that thread fuse. And when I cover it or press it, the fusible thread, which is activated by heat and moisture of my iron, it adheres or sticks to the under collar, keeping that seam allowance in place. This is called a wrap corner because I'm simply going to fold or wrap the seam allowance. It's already wrapped to the front side. And now I can sew, starting at the fold, stitching or surging the center front seam. On this next sample, I have already surged this section. Again, you can see that heavier white line is the thread fuse in the bobbin section. If you'd like, I'd recommend that you do a little trimming at the corner, trimming off part of that serge seam. I'm going to press that in just a few minutes, but I'd like to now show you how I turn this right side out. Again, placing the fabric with the rounded end in the corner, and then pinch the corner so that the point is at the corner, and turn this right side out. Now, instead of using your scissors or pencil point, you have the point of the turner to bring out the corner of the collar. The final step, I'll go to the ironing board and press this, adhering the fusible thread to the wrong side, or the inside of that under collar. So it's kind of a step-by-step -step process of making this. The notions really help to save time. When top pressing, I always use a press cloth and you can see what a great collar point I have. Again, you could use this on cuffs or lapel areas using this wrapped idea. About 13 years ago, I started Nancy's Notions, a mail order business of sewing supplies, and this collar point and tube turner was one of the first items that I tried to find or to get a supplier to have in my catalog. And I used it for collars and cuffs, and then one day I decided to read the directions. And it said to make spaghetti straps, and this is where I've really used it many times for sundresses or for belting. Making spaghetti straps out of knit fabric or woven, either style will work. I have a piece of knit fabric right here, and the knit fabric has stretch, greatest amount of stretch at the cross grain, and the least amount of stretch at the length of the fabric. For knit fabrics, cut strips about one and a half inches wide with the grain, the lengthwise grain. For woven fabrics, you want just a little bit of stretch, and you'll only achieve that by cutting the fabric on the bias, on the diagonal. So however you would like, whatever type of fabric you'd like, cut it an inch and a half wide on the bias for woven, on the straight of grain for knit fabrics. Sew or serge the strap together, sewing one end closed. And then again, clasp it closed. I have placed it on the rounded end and start working the bias strip over itself. This is woven fabric right now. You get it gathered all onto one side, open it up, and re remove the spaghetti strap. Now finish the job by simply pulling it right side out. And there you have a perfect spaghetti strap made with ease. If you have a quilting, craft, or gift project that needs bias binding around the edges, why not make it with a bias tape maker? The makers come in four different sizes to accommodate many of your sewing and quilting needs. They're easy to use, and I'd like to give you some time-saving tips of working with these specialty notions. Obviously, if you're going to be working with a bias tape maker, you need bias tape. I'd like to give you a hint. You may already know these, of course, but how to work with your ruler, rotary cutter, and mat for cutting bias strips. Check the ruler that you use with your mat for a 45-degree angle. And I'm working with a very small piece of fabric, but I've aligned the 45-degree mark of the ruler along the straight edge of the fabric 
and the linear mark on the, on the mat. And simply, like pizza cutter, slice the fabric. And you could cut several layers at once if you'd like to. I'm going to be working with a one inch bias tape maker, so I'm going to cut a two or cut my strips two inches wide using double the width of the finished size of the tape maker. And simply just cut these apart. And it only takes a few seconds to get nice, accurate strips. Seam these sections together. Obviously, you could cut many more if you'd like. And then you're going to insert them through the bias tape maker. As you saw earlier, there were four sizes. I'm going to be using the one inch finished width. It has a rounded end that's larger. There's a section in the middle for a pin to pass the fabric through and then the narrower end where the folded tape comes out. Do cut the strip on the angle, which is normally how it's cut, so that it easily inserts through the tape maker. And it's hard to push it through, that's why it has this opening for the pin. And just slide it down. As the fabric comes out, you may have to readjust it a little bit to make certain that the lengthwise edges are folded to the center. It's not going to do the pressing for you, it just is going to do the shaping of the fabric. Now press. And as you're pressing, you may, or as you're moving the tape maker, you may want to press very close to the end of the tape maker. And as you can see, it quickly makes the tape the right size. You can make it to match your fabric, coordinate, contrast, whatever you'd like, but it's very even and certainly extremely fast. This is a single fold, one inch wide. If you'd fold it in half, which you normally will do to finish the edges, you'll have a half inch finished bias tape. When putting it onto a quilt edge, for example, I'm going to unfold one of the edges to meet the cut edges of my quilt. On this sample, I have one edge unfolded, and I've placed all the raw edges together. I'm going to use that fusible thread once again. It's not 100% mandatory. It just saves some time when putting this together so that I'm stitching in the well of the press seam, and on the wrong side, in the bobbin, I had the fusible thread. You can see the heavier white stitching line. After sewing this into place, simply wrap the bias tape around the edges and cover the stitching, the fusible thread stitching, with the fold of the bias tape. Now without the thread fuse, you'd simply pin this area. If you're using the thread fuse, then at your ironing board, kind of pin base this in place, making certain that the fold of the fabric is covering the stitching line and fuse. And you'll find that this pressing holds the bias tape in place, and then you can top stitch along the fold. We're going to wrap up this video with some time-saving techniques for decorative stitching, using metallic thread, a stabilizer, a very lightweight bobbin thread, and a specialty sized needle. In chapter 6 of 10, 20, 30 minutes to sew, I show you some ideas of working with decorative threads and top stitching, etc. You'll find many of these ideas throughout this chapter. I'm working on this blouse that I'm placing decorative stitches down the buttonhole area. I like to use metallic thread. It adds just a little touch of elegance, and I think it's fun to work with. But sometimes metallic thread can be stubborn. It has a mind of its own. So here's what I like to do in working with it. On my machine, I already had the metallic thread threaded through the top. And because metallic thread is what it is, metallic, it becomes wiry sometimes. And to prevent it becoming wiry so it's more smooth, I like to use a product called Sewer's Aid and place a little drop of the silicone, and I've already done this, along about three or four times along the length of the spool. As the thread feeds off the spool, it's coated and it goes to the machine more readily. You may want to use that idea on many decorative threads, rayon or cotton. I have found it more than just using it for metallic thread. The eye of the needle is very important to have a larger size eye needle. I'm using a size 90 needle. The eye is larger so that the th thread will not fray as easily. Metallic thread and decorative threads tend to fray on a size smaller eye needle. 
The back of my fabric I've stabilized it, and for those of you who watch my television program Sewing with Nancy, you know that I like to stabilize many things. And I've put a temporary stabilizer on the back side of my buttonhole area. It's called Totally Stable. You use your favorite t method or item, but you can fuse this into place. It fuses on temporarily and allows the fabric to have some body. And last but not least, in the bobbin thread, use a lightweight thread. There's a thread designed specifically for embroidery stitches. It's such a lightweight thread, it's called Sew Bob. Notice I've marked my bobbin so I know what it is. And I have a comparable one inside my bobbin case. Metallic thread on the top, a lighter thread on the bobbin, and I'm ready to do some stitching. At my machine, I have my machine set for the buttonhole setting. I've loosened the tension by two notches and I have a marking started and I simply sew. It's more the preparation of working with decorative stitches than the actual sewing that takes the time. But I'm sure that you'll find by working with these decorative stitches that it will add a little embellishment and extra accent to your garment. I'll clip the threads and show you what a nice stitch this gives. The metallic thread, it comes to the front side. On the back side, you'll see that a little touch of metallic because the bobbin thread has a looser tension. We'll just remove the stitches. And then you can remove the stabilizer. It's temporary. Hold on to the stitches. And you have the embellishment already complete. So try these time-saving tips when working with decorative stitches. I'd like to thank you for watching Time Saving Techniques, and I hope sometime you'll be able to join me on public television for Sewing with Nancy. I'd also like to say thank you to Oxmoor House for publishing my book on 10, 20, 30 minutes to sew. If you'd like to get any of the notions that you saw demonstrated today, I do carry them in our catalog, Nancy's Notions. It has many other notions than what I was able to show you today. If you'd like a copy of this, you can call one 800 833-0690 and we'll send you a copy or send your name and address to Nancy's Notions, P.O. Box 683, Beaver Dam, Wisconsin 53916. Well, my hope is that you'll use these techniques on video and in our book in your sewing room or your sewing area. Remember, you do not have to devote a whole weekend or many evenings to sewing. If you allocate about a half an hour a day, you'll be amazed what you can accomplish. And again, those half hours of time mount up to finished products. Happy sewing.